Praise God. Good evening, everybody. And uh, good evening to everybody who's watching on Facebook. Thank you for so much for joining us. And um, I'm just really excited about this study that you got we're in on. You've already got it. And it's really transitioning our mindset from trying to get God to do things for us to realizing that by grace, he's already done everything for us. And um, it's just a matter of, of learning by faith to appropriate what he's given us freely by grace. Amen. So praise God for that. And um, I think the first, the first thing that we, that's necessary to learn is, is to learn what God has provided by grace. Amen. What God has provided by grace. Because a, a lot of Christians view God as though they have to try to get something from him, you know. And um, when you believe that it's already been given to you by grace, uh, that takes a lot of pressure and burden off of us, you know, that we don't have to work for the good things that God um, has given us, such as healing and, and um, prosperity and, and, um, and peace, you know, and joy. We don't have to work for those things. Uh, the work part comes when you're working to stay in faith, and we'll, we'll talk about that tonight a little bit. So anyways, without further ado, um, let's go ahead and jump into the scripture. Um, first of all, we're going to review lesson six. We're going to review the discipleship questions there. So in your lesson six packet, in, uh, which is called Such As I Have, we're going to review those discipleship questions in the back of that packet there. And so the uh, number one is Jesus. Number two is God. Number three is be removed and be cast into the sea. Number four is in our hearts. Number five is those things which we say. Number six is whatsoever we say. Number seven is when we pray. Number eight is Jesus. Number nine is B were. The letter B were. Uh, number 10 is the Lord. Number 11 is such as he had. Number 12 is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. <clears throat> number 13 is no. Number 14 is faith to be healed. Number 15 is stand upright on thy feet. Number 16 is the crippled man leaped and walked. Number 17 is things to come concerning his sons. Number 18 is command you me. Command you me. Okay. Um, does anybody need, need to repeat any of those answers? All right. All right. Praise God. So just a little bit of review from last week. Um, again, lesson six, such as I have. It's about learning what we have, you know, and uh, being faithful with that and, and learning about all the things that Christ has given us. And as, as we've talked about on Sunday, that we were born again through the incorruptible seed of the Word of God. And that means that everything that's in the Word is in us. I'm, that doesn't mean that everything that's in the Word is what you're experiencing, but that means that everything in the Word is in you, because that is what makes you who you are, is His Word that was sown in you. And then in Romans 10, He talks about that you, you hear the Word, and you believe the Word, that Jesus Christ died for you. That's how salvation happens. And so that's what happens when the, the incorruptible seed was sown in our hearts. We believed it, and therefore it produced life. It produced salvation. And um, it's really that way with anything in the Christian life is, uh, is learning what God has already sown in our hearts and what God has given us. And then you water that seed by uh, applying your faith to that specific thing that God has given you. And, you know, you can have great faith for healing, but you cannot have really any faith when it comes to um, prosperity. You know, or you can have great faith for prosperity and not have uh, very much faith for, for healing. You know, so it's about learning everything that God has given us and then, um, and then learning to, to receive that. Amen? So the good news is that God's already given it by grace. So it's called such as I have. It's not about what you don't have and trying to get God to, you know, pry his hand open and, and give you things. It's what you, you already have inside of you. Amen? 
that Jesus Christ has given us freely. Praise God. I think too often times in the body of Christ, we, uh, we minimize too much what Jesus has done, you know, and, and we make the cross of no effect in our life. And we, um, we get into a workspace mentality where we're trying to earn our salvation and uh, we're trying to keep our salvation with our good works and we're trying to get God to do good things in our life by doing good things and, and trying to live uh, the right way and to live holy. And it's good to live the right way and to live holy, but how many of you know that you know nothing God has given you is, is, is yours because of how good you are? It's all because of what Christ has done for us. And so really the Christian life is about learning to magnify and maximize uh, what Jesus did for us, the work on the cross, amen, and when he rose again. So praise God. So we're going to get into lesson seven tonight, and it's called God's Best. God's Best. Does anybody have any questions on last week's teaching or what I just talked about right now? We're good? Okay. All right. Father God, thank you so much for this evening. And um, your word tells us in the Hebrews, God, that, you know, unless we mix faith with your word, that your word's not going to profit us anything. And so I just pray tonight that we would mix faith with your word and um, that we would be blessed in that way and, and receive what your word offers us in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So lesson seven, God's best. In the early part of 2000, you can go ahead and follow along in your, <clears throat> in your outlines there. In the early part of 2000, I ministered on grace and faith at a church in Louisville, Texas. And it was the same truth I've taught thousands of times. I emphasized how faith works and countered some common misconceptions, such as faith is believing God to do something in the future. And the Bible clearly says that faith is now. Amen. Believing what God's already done. While sharing that true Bible faith is believing what God has already done by grace, I used healing as my main example. Chris Ochinski attended that meeting and took a tape of the message home to her sick daughter. And Nikki loved the Lord and enjoyed a close relationship with him. However, at age 19, she had been very ill for five long years. Nikki was believing God for her healing, but hadn't received the manifestation yet. She'd seen visions of the Lord, and in them he told her that she would be healed. Because of this, she had faith and was happy. Nikki was praising God, even though her doctor, who kept a weekly appointment with her, never expected to see her alive again. Nikki was nearly gone. How many of you know that, that um, uh, you know, medicine and doctors are, are very limited? Amen. So, um, you know, medicine and doctors, they, they can, they're definitely a, a good thing. Praise God. They can be a good thing. But um, it's, so, it's so imperative that we learn to walk by faith because... There, there's going to be something you're going to face in your life that's going to require you to walk by faith, that the doctors and the medicine can't help you with. Amen? So although she had faith, <coughs> excuse me, it was misdirected. Nikki believed God. Nikki believed God was, future tense, going to heal her. She was passively waiting on the Lord to do something. And then she listened to my message on cassette about how God has already done it, and faith just reaches over to appropriate what has already been provided. <coughs> Excuse me. My statement, progressive miracles aren't God's best, really upset her at first. I'm not against progressive miracles, and there's no bad way to be healed. However, some ways are definitely better than others, and God's best for everyone is always an instantaneous miracle. The only reason <coughs> that progressive miracles come is because of the way that people believe. Their theology, the way that they think, only lets it manifest a little at a time. And since the Lord had told her that she would have a progressive miracle, Nikki took offense at my remark. But because she had such a good relationship with God, she just asked him about it. And while listening to the tape, she said in her heart, Now God, what about that? You told me I was going to be healed progressively. And he answered saying, Nikki, that's according to your faith. That's what you were believing for. It was all you could receive. So I was meeting you where you were. But my best is instantaneous. How many of you know that God will meet you where you are? Amen. Amen. <coughs> when um, when Peter, excuse me, when Peter was uh, starting to walk on the water, and then he started to drown, you know, Jesus didn't forsake him, right? He he pulled Peter up. He didn't let him drown. And he said, Peter, you know, why why did you doubt? You know, why did you get your eyes off of? Off of my word, I told you to come on the water to meet me. And um, 
But he didn't, he didn't let Peter drown. And that's the great thing about the Lord is he's gracious and he's merciful. And, uh, you know, he meets us where we're at. Praise God. But how many of you want God's best for your life? You know, I want God's best. And, you know, God will heal you and set you free according to your faith. But, praise God, I want God's best. And um, so once she understood, Nikki saw that she could have been healed five years before. She had been passively waiting on God. And her faith wasn't out there for an instantaneous healing. She hadn't understood how grace and faith work together to bring into manifestation what God has already provided. And this became a revelation to her as she recognized that her healing was already done. The next day I went over to the Ochinski's house. And I was praying that Nikki would become so angry that she'd reach out in aggressive, violent faith and take her healing. Up until then, she hadn't been able to feed herself, go to the bathroom on her own, or even brush her hair. Nikki wasn't paralyzed, but she was so weak and frail that she couldn't even lift her hand, much less move, walk, or, or do anything. However, after I arrived, she became so riled up that she put her arm across my chest, uh, pushed me out of the way, stood up, and walked. And all I did was redirect her faith. Nikki had thought that faith was something that she did, and sooner or later, God would respond and grant healing. And I simply told her, no, that's not Bible faith. You must believe that God has already done it. See, we're waiting by, we're waiting for God to approve that which we're seeking. But how many of you know that that Christ is is the the evidence of of everything that God has approved for us by grace? Amen. Amen. So you know we're looking for God's approval on certain things in our life. Like God, you know, do you want me healed? Is that your, you know, can I have your approval on that? <coughs> when Christ, you know, he became, he was, he was beaten and bruised for us. And by his stripes, we were healed. And, um, you know, so, so through Christ, God has already approved healing in our life. You know, it's like we're seeking approval on something that the Lord has already, already given us. And, <clears throat> you know, how many of you as, as parents, maybe when you were kids, you know, you went up to your parents this way, or now that you're older, your kids come to you. And um, they're like, you know, can I have this, you know, or can, you know, can I have a lollipop or whatever after, after supper, or, you know, lunch? And you're like, yeah, go ahead. And what, you know, how would you react if like every time they, they came up to you, uh, they, they kept coming up to you and asking you, can I have a lollipop? Can I? It's like, I already told you yes the first time. You know, you already have my approval. Why do you keep seeking my approval? I've already given it to you. And that's how I feel like God is kind of seeing us, you know. Is that we're, we're constantly seeking his approval on healing, but God is like, you know, the sacrifice was made once and for all. You know, once and for all. That means our forgiveness is eternal. If, if, if Jesus told Peter, if he, if he told him, Peter said, how many times shall I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And Jesus said, assuredly, I said to you, 70 times seven, right? In one day, in one day. And so, that, so God is telling us, I need your forgiveness to be unconditional and, and never-ending. So <clears throat> when it comes to us receiving forgiveness from God, you know, if, if we're like not, we're not like God, amen, we can, <laughs> we can all agree on that. We are so far below God and his standards. But if God requires that of us, how much more is, is his forgiveness available to us? You know? I, I think there's too much hypocrisy going on in the church to where um, <clears throat> we try our best to forgive. And we try our best when our children are feeling sick to take them to the hospital and to make them well. If we're sick, we take, we take ourselves to the hospital and try to feel well. You know, we seek forgiveness and, and we seek healing. But for some reason, we don't think God is like that. You know, it's almost like we're saying, God, um, I am more righteous than you. And it's like, you know, if, if God tells you to forgive others and, and, and you want to be well and healed when you're feeling bad, you know, how much more do you think God wants you to feel well when you're feeling bad? You know, if, if, if God was for sickness, then why did he create our bodies with an immune system? You know, there's no glory in sickness. There's just not. As a matter of fact, in the Bible, it says that when people were healed... God got the glory. Amen? And I'm not condemning you for, you know, if you're feeling sick or anything like that, so please don't misunderstand me. I'm just trying to help us to understand that God wants us well. 
And he's approved it by his son, Jesus. Amen? Amen. And we got to reach out. we got to take what he's given us. He's given us healing. He's given us wholeness and restoration in our hearts. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so then my faith <clears throat> reach over into the spirit realm and take what is rightfully yours. So you must believe that God has already done it. Healing manifested. And, and he, boom, just as soon as Nikki received the revelation, her healing manifested. That she doesn't have to wait on God passively like, God, do you approve of this? No, she knew. Jesus wants me well. Amen? And this ministered to me too, and I saw how this understanding could effectively redirect a person's faith. And therefore, I've been trying to share it with as many people as I can. I've seen more individuals healed <clears throat> in the past few years than I have in a long, long time. It's simply because people are understanding and saying, I'm no longer asking God to heal me. I am receiving my healing, which he has already provided. When I pray for people, I'm no longer asking God to heal them. Instead, I'm ministering healing, and I'm giving them healing. See, <clears throat> the same healing virtue that, that God has placed in me, and I'm seeing infinitely better results, and so are others. Hallelujah. So it's not a matter of, you know, trying to get God's healing to manifest. The Bible says that the power, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead, it, it dwells in us. Right? That same power. And so I don't have to ask for God's healing power. I have it. We just need to release what we have. Hallelujah. And all of this applies to your financial prosperity, too. God has already commanded blessing and the power to get wealth upon you. You just have to learn how to reach out in faith and receive it. God doesn't give you wealth directly. He gives you power to get it instead. Right? So you're probably not going to wake up in the morning with like a million dollar package on your front doorstep. But God gives you the power to get wealth though. In Deuteronomy 8.18 it says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God. For it is he that gives thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. And as a born again believer, you already have God's wealth anointing and prosperity power. However, you must believe in your heart that you already have it and then put it to work by faith. Many things are involved in the process of putting this power to work and seeing wealth manifest. And you need to wholeheartedly see God and his kingdom first. You must trust in him and start giving. It's important to understand that there's always a period of time between sowing and reaping. Also, you must go out and work. There are many, many practical things that you can do to actively cooperate with God's laws of faith concerning prosperity. The Lord has worked these truths deep into my life. My wife and I have gone from nearly starving to death on several occasions as impoverished young ministers to seeing God provide an average of $1,200 every hour of every day for the year, of every day of the year for the purpose of preaching the gospel. Prosperity is simply having enough of God's supply to fully accomplish his will for your life. So prosperity is not selfish. The world's prosperity is selfish. God's prosperity is not selfish. Prosperity is simply, again, having enough of God's supply to fully accomplish his will for your life. I pray that you get a hold of this revelation and fully accomplish your destiny in him. See, a lot of people, when we preach these things, a lot of people put this kind of teaching down and be like, oh, you're just the whole, you know, health and prosperity, you know, group and, and bunch. But it's like, well... I believe that. I believe that Jesus has provided that for us. That's not the foundation of my faith, and that's not the foundation of my salvation. Obviously, it's, it's a relationship with Jesus Christ and his blood that has cleansed us from all sin. But nevertheless, there are certain benefits that come with that. Amen? And who am I to deny what God has promised me? Hallelujah. I am a co-heir with Christ. I am an heir of God. And as an heir of God, all these things belong to me in Christ Jesus freely by grace. Hallelujah. But again, the, the most important thing is seeking God first. So once you believe that God by grace has already provided prosperity, you'll begin to reach out in faith and take it. You'll start cooperating with the power and anointing to get wealth that is already in your born-again spirit. And instead of just praying and asking God to dump a bunch of money in your lap while you sit at home watching, you know, as the stomach turns on television... <laughs> Uh, you'll get up and go out and you'll start touching things. Why? Because you know that God has promised to bless all the work of your hands. <clears throat> when you start doing things, believing for that anointing to manifest and prosperity to come, then you'll start seeing it. And I want to make this proposition to you that 
You know, so many of us, we're just, we're, we're killing ourselves in life. And, and what I mean by that is we're just, we're driving ourselves into the ground. You know, we're, we're putting too much on our shoulders for us to carry. We're trying to do too much to get wealthy. We're trying to do too much to get our healing. We're trying to do too much to receive forgiveness. But when you believe that the anointing is on your life and you believe that the grace of God is active and working in your life, you don't have to try so hard yourself to get it. Amen? Because you have favor on your life. It's like everything that you touch, instead of it being cursed <coughs> and having to work extra hard, God blesses what you put your hand to. But it's all according to your faith. It's all according to what you believe. If you don't believe you're blessed, then you're not going to be blessed in life. If you believe you're blessed, then you're going to see that. You're going to see that actively work. It's all, a, it's all a matter. We've been talking about this on Sundays for quite a while now. It's, it's all a matter of getting in God's word and becoming spiritually minded, learning what God has promised us. Amen? Thank you, Lord. So if you, just, <clears throat> if you just sit at home, pray, and wait for God to magically put money in your wallet, you will never receive it. God said he blessed the work of your hands, and 100 times zero is zero. You need to believe that God has already done his part and then do something. It's not, God, did you see that I worked? Now release your power. No, you're working because you believe that God has already given you this anointing to get wealth, and you're acting in faith to release that power to manifest the prosperity the Lord has already provided. Confession doesn't make God move. You're wrong if you think reciting, by his stripes I am healed 599 times will force God to heal you. You can't make God do anything. Faith does not move him. God, by grace, has already moved as much as he's going to. He's already provided everything. Your need was abundantly supplied before you even had it. And since the Lord has already done it, you confess God's word to encourage your own heart and to drive off the devil. It might take you confessing that word 599 times before you actually believe. But God is not the one who needs to move. He already has. Confession moves you into faith and the devil out of the way so your manifestation can come. You don't have to read the Bible to make God love you. He won't love you any more than he already does if you read the word. And neither will he love you any less if you don't. However... So let me say, however. however, however, you will love God more if you read the Bible and you will love him less if you don't. His love does not change. Ours does. God has put things in his word that draw out this love and everything else that he has already placed in your life. Living holy does not make God love you more. Neither does a lack of holiness Cause him to love you less. God by grace is the same toward everyone. However, if you don't live holy, you won't love God as much. Through sin, your heart will become hardened and you'll deaden yourself to the things of God. You need to study the word, fellowship with believers, and do good things, but not in order to move God. He has already moved, but you have to recognize that you must, by faith, reach over into the spiritual realm and receive. Attending church, reading the word, and listening to good Bible teaching, uh, they don't cause God to move in your life. They help your faith. Amen? They help your faith. Even doing this study won't make God love you more. He isn't going to look down on you and say, you did it. You know, you did Andrew's Bible study. I'm giving you three stars. And at six stars, you'll get one answered prayer. <laughs> That's not how God works. The Lord loves you and his grace is the same toward you, whether or not you do this study. However... You will not be the same toward God and his grace without his understanding. <clears throat> I shared a, um, I, I blog um, like three to four, I think three times a week. And um, I send it out to all, of, all the men. So all you, all you men know about it. But, um, you know, my, my blog today was on, uh, is, is, your well, is your well full? Is your well full? And, um. You know, God, God, what the Holy Spirit does, his, <clears throat> his work and his job in our life is <clears throat> he takes of what is in you and he uses that 
to help you and minister to you and bless you. You know, so as believers, when we go into God's word and we are filling ourselves with his word, we are creating an environment, an atmosphere in our life where the Holy Spirit can, can come and use what word we're reading to, you know, to bring it to life and to bless us, to bring things to our mind. To help, it, to help us and, and comfort us. But the Holy Spirit uses our knowledge to give us understanding and to give us revelation. <clears throat> and so many of us, we're expecting God to bless us, but our well is empty and it's, it's dry. There hasn't been any water in there in a long time. So, the God, so God uses what is in your well to bless you. You know, and it's, it's really... I, you know, the well of faith. We'll just call it that, the well of faith, because faith comes by hearing the word. Amen? Amen. Amen. So, God, you, you know, if we say, well, God's well is infinite. Amen? He's got an infinite amount, of, but it's not according to God's faith that you receive. It's according to your faith. Amen. And your faith does come from God. Hallelujah. It's the God kind of faith. But nevertheless, it's about us getting in the word, and God uses that. To, to release blessings in our life of what he's already given us. Amen. So, <clears throat> apart from this revelation, you won't have the same degree of faith operating in your life. This teaching is helping your faith, your positive response to what God has already done. Reading the Bible and going to church helps you. Studying the word and fellowshipping with other believers stirs your love for God. However, the Lord would love you exactly the same if you never went to church or read the word again. But it's stupid not to do these things. Why would you cut yourself off from the very things God has given to help you walk by faith? Although you need to do those things, don't ever think that your actions make God react. He never reacts to us. He has already done everything by grace, and faith is our reaction to him. Flesh, works, and legalism all try to do things in order to solicit a positive response from God. But the Lord said that he'd never share his glory with anyone. You didn't make God save, heal, or prosper you. He has already done it. All you did was respond positively in faith to reach out and appropriate what he had already provided. And don't confuse trying to make God do something with your faith causing to manifest what he has already done. You can't force God to do anything, but by faith you can make manifest what he has already provided. Faith is simply your positive response to what God has already done. You don't get the glory, and you can't say that you made something happen. It was God's power, not yours. He wasn't reacting to you or anything you've done, you simply responded to his grace. Faith or grace taken alone, either one apart from the other, will kill you. And they must complement each other in order for you to experience the abundant life that God intended for you to enjoy. Faith teaching, if it's just do something to move God, <clears throat> will kill you. Amen? It'll, it'll, it'll wear you out. And you'll end up stuck in the flesh, frustrated, legalistic, and works-oriented. And on the other hand, extreme grace will also kill you. If it's God does everything and you have nothing to do with it, your, your subsequent passivity will prevent, will prevent what the Lord has done from manifesting in your life. Then you'll have to make, make up all kinds of excuses for why you aren't experiencing the abundant life God provided by his grace and clearly promised in his word. Grace and faith must work together. Paul understood and lived by this truth in 1 Corinthians 15.10. He said, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. See, Paul cooperated with God's grace. He didn't labor in order to get it, but once grace came, he labored in faith to reach out and receive what God had already done. I pray that God gives you understanding and wisdom as you begin to harmonize this revelation of grace and faith and apply it to your daily life. The rest of this study will build upon the foundation that has been laid thus far. And I'll be sharing some things that will really encourage and help you to successfully walk this out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So again, this is lesson seven. The title is uh, God's Best. And, you know, this is, this is God's best for us. I don't want to settle, I don't want to settle for less than, than his best. And um, I think all of us have room to grow in this. You know, we have room to grow. There's more, there's more for us to attain. You know, there's more for us to learn and to understand. But we must allow God to continue to transform us by the renewing, by the renovation of our mind so that we can walk in these, uh, in these truths and, and, and clearly receive what he's given us by grace. 
Amen? I feel like too many of us, we're, <clears throat> we're walking according to the ways of the world. And um, we are being conformed to the world. You know, we're, we're being carnally minded. And God is calling us to be separate. God is calling us out of the world. The way to be the light of the world and to minister to the world is not to be like them. It's to be different. And God is calling us to be different. I understand some of these truths may seem weird to you, and it's because you're carnally minded. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but it's true. Some, when I talk about these things, some, people, some Christians just scoff and say, oh, you know, that's not possible. Yeah, it'd be, it's not possible in the natural, but God has called us to live and walk by faith. And I realize that not all of us are, are you know, none of us are doing that 100% perfectly. But nevertheless, if, if God tells us something in his word, you know, don't, don't you want that? I want God's best. I did not become a Christian. When, I don't know how you are, but how I am, when I do something, I don't do it half-heartedly. I go all in. That's why I have to watch myself and what I get involved in. Because I'm all in whatever I do. I mean, I'm, I'm in it to win it, baby. And um, when I became a Christian, I didn't get into this to feel good about myself and go to church every Sunday and just be a goody little two-shoes guy. You know, I didn't. And I, I, and I actually despise that life. Who, that's boring. Who wants to do that? You know? Who wants to put their religious shoes on every Sunday and go to church and feel better about yourself during the week? That's the boring life. I would reject it if that's what it was. But you know what attracts me to the gospel is Jesus. And he's real, and his power is real, and his love is real, and his peace and his joy is real. And the relationship with him is real. I'm not, I'm not in this because, you know, I just, Christianity sounds like a good religious thing to do. No, this is, this is a real relationship. Amen? And um, so I didn't get into this to just feel better about myself. I want God's best. I want to know him. I don't just want to live according to man's tra you know, traditional teaching and just be content with less. I want his best. And I want his best for you. <laughs> I want his best for you. And um, I just pray that tonight, you know, that, that we all just really uh, contemplate. Um, are, are we seeking God's best, you know, or are we settling for less? <clears throat> and I think that's what Satan's goal is really to do in our life is Satan's goal is really to get us to settle for less. And uh, I mean, that's what he did with Adam and Eve in the garden. You know, he, he got them to settle for less than God's best. This world is not God's best. It's not. It's plagued by sin. You know, because mankind succumbed to the temptation of Satan, and they settled for less than God's best. And that's what Satan is still doing today with believers, getting us to settle for God's best. Did God surely say? God didn't mean that. When God said the just shall not walk by, by um, you know, by, by the flesh, by the natural, but they, by sight, but they shall walk by faith. Did God, God didn't really like mean that. It's okay to walk by the by sight a little bit, you know. It's it's okay to, to live by that a little bit. I mean, nobody nobody walks in you know perfect healing anyways. It's okay. Everybody gets sick. It's okay. You know, Satan gets a, he convinces us to settle for less. And I'm not saying that we don't have struggles in life. But I, all of us have struggles in life and. All of us experience temptation and attacks from the enemy, but, you know, are you seeking God's best, though? And I, I think that's what God is, is challenging us. Like, Jesus didn't die just so that we could live mediocre lives and, and allow Satan to take advantage of us. You know, I want God's best. I remember when I was going to a church in, um, in, in California, and, man, I forgot the, the name of the church. But anyways, they were real big on like uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, and, you know, healing and people falling out and deliverance and things like that. And um, one of the one of the guys came up to me and he was like, he came up to me one Sunday and he was like, brother, do you want to see the, the sick healed, the dead raised and uh, the oppressed delivered, you know, the blind eyes open, the deaf ears open. And 
And when he, when he told me that, man, my heart just leaped because I tell you, I want to see that more than anything. I, that is such a huge desire. When he said that, it's just like, I don't think he understood the desire that's in my heart to see that. To see that, because I, I, it's a beautiful thing when the power of God, you know, when we take hold of that and it just, it manifests itself in different ways in our life. That is my desire more than anything. And I, when that guy asked me that question, I don't think he realized, man, I want that more than anything. And I think as, as Christians, I know we need to stir ourselves up. We need to, once again, desire the things of God. And desire God's best for our life. And refuse to settle for less. Amen? This is what God is calling us to. I'm not saying that we have it all together. I'm not saying that we understand it perfectly. I'm not saying we're walking in the power of God perfectly. But I am saying let's desire it. Let's start there. Let's desire it. Because the Bible says those who seek shall find. Those who knock it shall be open to them. Those who ask they shall receive. And I believe the first step into walking in the gifts of the Holy Spirit is to desire them. Amen. Let me go over here to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12. In verse 31. He says here, and this is, let me, let me just read all the gifts here. He talks about in, in chapter 12 there that we are all members of the body. One body, but many members individually. And in verse 28, God has appointed uh, apostles, prophets, teachers, um, miracles, uh, gifts of healings, helps, and administrations, varieties of tongues. And then he says in verse 31, earnestly desire the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then he starts talking about love. Okay? And obviously we know love is more important than hope. Love is more important than faith. It's the greatest of them all. But he says, earnestly desire the best gifts, the greater gifts. And, you know, all of us are, I have a different gifting than Joanne. I have a different, you guys, you guys saw Jerry Garcia here, right, recently. And he's going to come back here this year. For those of you who are here for Jerry Garcia, he just operates in the, in the healing. You see everybody's gift in, in different operations. You see Bobby Andean here. Bobby Andean is a, is a teacher. He's an amazing teacher of the word of God. We all have different gifts and anointings. And when we come together, God uses those gifts to build up and minister to the body. And you guys have gifts. This is not just look at the pastor and the pastor has all the gifts. No, you guys have gifts that I don't have. Amen. Don't be jealous of other people's gifts. He says, earnestly desire the best gifts. Guess who's the, who the giver of the gifts is? The Holy Spirit. Amen. And the Holy Spirit dwells in each and every one of us. And at any given time, when you're sensitive to the Holy Spirit, you can operate in the gift that comes from Him. <clears throat> Amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so God is calling us to walk in His best. Amen? Does anybody have any, uh, any questions or comments? No? All right. Praise God. We're good. But we're all going to ask some questions here to do some review. And uh, just go ahead and blurt out the answer when you have it. So 1A is concerning healing. What is always God's best for everyone? An instantaneous miracle. Why would God want you to suffer another day with something? <laughs> it doesn't make sense, right? <laughs> When Moses asked Pharaoh, you know, when God plagued uh, Egypt with the, with the frogs, Moses asked Pharaoh, when do you want God to remove these frogs? Pharaoh said, tomorrow. It's like, wow, Pharaoh is dumb, you know? Why not right now? But God's not like Pharaoh. God's not dumb. <laughs> Praise God. God wants, every, God wants you delivered now. Now. Thank you, Lord. 1B, when we pray for people and minister healing, what are we doing? Loving other people, that's good, yes. When we pray for people and minister healing, what are we doing? We are, we are definitely loving other people. Um, 
The answer here is we're no longer asking God to heal them, but we are giving them healing, the same healing virtue that God has placed in us. Hallelujah. In 2a, what has God already commanded upon us? According, this is according to Deuteronomy 8.18 and Matthew 6.33. It should be there in your scriptures. What has God already commanded upon us? The blessing and the power to get well. The blessing and the power to get well. Exactly. To be, once we believe that God by grace has already provided prosperity, what must we do? Once we believe it's already ours, what must we do? Reach out in faith. Just take it, right? Reach out in faith and take it. Start cooperating with the power and anointing to get wealth that is already in our born again spirits. To see, why are we working? That's according to, to the answer there is Deuteronomy 28 8 and 28 12. Why are we working? Yep. Exactly. We believe that God's already given us the anointing to get wealth, and we're acting in faith. We're not acting in faith to get to, to get the anointing. You understand? We're acting in faith because we have the anointing. To release that power to manifest the prosperity the Lord has already provided. 3A, what moves us into faith and the devil out of the way so our manifestation can come? Confession. Confession, your words. Use your words. They're powerful. 3B, where has God put things that draw out his love and everything else that he has already placed in our lives? In his word. In his word. That's where it all is. 3C, we shouldn't confuse trying to make God do something with what? We shouldn't confuse trying to make God do something with what? Mm -hmm. So obviously, we can't make God do anything, right? But our faith causes us to manifest what he's already done. Okay, and so don't confuse those two things. You're not making God do something. Your faith is simply causing him to manifest what he's already done. 4a, what will happen if we take faith or grace alone, either one apart from the other? It'll kill you. Yeah. It'll kill you. Well, he's already, he's already blessed us, but we won't walk in the blessing. Amen? So 4b, what must complement each other or work together in order for us to experience the abundant life God intended for us to enjoy? Grace and faith. Grace and faith. That's right. 5A, according to 1 Corinthians 15.10. Does somebody have that there? 1 Corinthians 15. Go ahead and read that. 1 Corinthians 15.10. By the grace of God, I am, I am, and his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Hallelujah. So what did Paul cooperate with? The grace, of God. the grace of God. The grace of God does not make you lazy. It, it motivates you to work even more, as Paul did. Amen. 5B, once grace came, Paul labored in faith to reach out and receive what? What God had already done. That's right. What God had already done. Praise God. Praise God. Does anybody have any questions or comments? And, and if you have a question or comment, go ahead and leave that below uh, if you're watching with us. And uh, we'll definitely get, definitely get back to you. Okay. Are we good? So we've got to uh, take, the grace, we've got to take what belongs to us. Take what belongs to you. Exactly. Yeah. And, and if you're, but if you're not in God's word and you're just trying, like, you can't force something to manifest. You know? It's, it's going to, when, when a tree bears fruit, it's not like trying super hard to bear fruit. The reason it's so easy for that tree to bear that fruit and it happens so naturally is because the tree is gathering um, life and nutrients from the soil and the sun and the water. You know? And so that's the same way with us. As Christians, it's like we're not trying to force ourselves to manifest healing or prosperity. It's just better being planted in God's word. 
You know, and then when you're planted in God's word, it's like God's power will manifest in your life. Because this is where faith comes by, is, is his word. So I understand as, as a Christian, if you're hearing this and you're like, man, you know, God's best sounds great, but that sounds like a lot of hard work. Well, it's impossible that, you know, by yourself, you can't produce, you don't have the power to produce healing or prosperity in your life, but the power comes from the word. And, and that's what God is calling us to, to become is, is, you know, a, a good, um, just allowing a good conductor to where we just allow God's word to flow through us, you know, and, and to be um, solidly planted in his word and allow, allow his word to produce these good things in our life. So that's what we've been talking about on Sundays. Amen. So. Because you can't produce the, the fruit of the spirit. Um, by, by walking in the flesh. You know, you can't produce the fruit of the Spirit by being carnally minded. And apart from the Word, that's what we are. We're all carnally minded and fleshly uh, apart, apart from God's Word. So we've got to get into His Word and become spiritually minded and, you know, allow that to manifest in our life. So, yeah, you had a question? Oftentimes when somebody doesn't practice something that is um, clearly a part of God's word, it's simply because they just don't understand. Uh, for example, if, you know, when it comes to prayer, if, if we're not praying, um, that just simply means we don't understand the uh, role of prayer and the power that prayer can have in our life. So that's why we don't practice things. <laughs> because if you believed it worked, you would practice it. Amen. <laughs> so praise God. All right, we good? Let me go ahead and turn this off here.